On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I am Chuck Frankel, a trustee of the World Affairs Council and your moderator this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest. James Gustav Speth joined the faculty at Vermont Law School in 2010. A distinguished senior fellow with DEMOS, he completed his decade-long tenure in 2009 as dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. From 1993 to 1999, he was administrator at the United Nations Development Program and chair of the UN Development Group. Prior to uh, his service at the United Nations, he was founder and president of the World Resources Institute, professor of law at Georgetown University, chairman of the U.S. Council on Environmental Quality in the Carter Administration, and senior attorney and co-founder of the National Natural Resources Defense Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gus Speth. Thank you, Chuck, and thank all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I had an opportunity to speak at the World Affairs Council Asilomar Conference uh, once back when the annual meeting was held there, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be uh, back here uh, again uh, at the council. I, uh, I see a clock on the wall. I'll try to stick to the, to the time limit. I didn't do that one time when I was a dean at Yale, and I apologize for not having my watch, and the student said uh, from the audience, that's okay, Dean Speth, there's a calendar on the wall behind you. <laughs> I'll try to do better. Uh, I want to talk first uh, generally uh, about uh, uh, this new book, America the Possible, uh, and then uh, talk a little more in detail about some of the international issues that are associated. Uh, with it. And I want to begin on a personal note and just say that this uh, process of producing this book uh, began when I uh, really started thinking about the world we were building for uh, my six grandchildren uh, now. And, uh, you know, what is the America that we would like to see them have uh, towards mid-century when they are fully grown? Uh, and um, you know, I, I still believe it's possible, and this is one of the points in the book, that it's possible to build an attractive uh, future for them uh, and for your grandchildren and others, but we're certainly not on that track now. Uh, and we won't get there by doing uh, more of the same. And we haven't got much time uh, to change course. Uh, so the book really addresses this, this question of how do we get there and what do we do uh, now? Uh, so I want to make four basic points uh, that come out of the, uh, of the book, four imperatives uh, as, I, as I see them. And the first is the imperative of system change. We don't normally think in these terms, but um, if you look at all the trends uh, in our country today, it frankly is darn distressing. Uh, and I, you know, review these issues uh, uh, in the book and, and conclude that the only plausible explanation of so many challenges uh, facing our country is that we, it's, we have a bad case of system failure. Um, let's just look at the international comparisons for a second. I, I, I identified, uh, took the sort of top 20 uh, ad advanced democracies, uh, what Rumsfeld uh, might have called the old o OECD, uh, and, uh, and uh, then looked at 30 different indicators of national well-being and, and, and international uh, citizenship. And, you know, what you find is that we are not just, you know, middling performers. We are the worst in almost every one of these uh, indicators uh, across that international uh, cross-section. We have the highest poverty rate, uh, the most inequality, the least social mobility, uh, the lowest score on, uh, you know, UNICEF's index of material well-being of children. Uh, uh, the Men in the audience might be surprised to know that we have the worst score on the UN's gender equality index. Uh, probably not a surprise to others in the audience. Um, uh, we have the highest expenditure of, of, of health care. A lot of this is in percentage of GDP. Uh, and, uh, and yet, what does it buy us? It buys us the highest infant mortality rate, the highest prevalence of mental health problems, the highest obesity rate, 
uh, the highest percentage of people going without health care due to cost, uh, the highest consumption of antidepressants, and the shortest life expectancy. Um, you know, we also have very poor international scores on, on uh, um, uh, educational performance, uh, attainment, the highest homicide rate, the largest prison population, absolutely and per capita, about a fourth of the world's uh, prisoners uh, here in this country. And on the environmental side, the highest uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, and the highest uh, water consumption per capita. Australia may be slightly ahead of us now on, on the per capita carbon dioxide emissions. We have the lowest score on the World Economic Forum's Environmental Performance Index, the second worst score on the Ecological Footprint uh, Index. Um, you know, and we, we spend uh, at the bottom of the OECD on international development assistance and humanitarian uh, relief. We, of course, have the highest military spending and, uh, and the largest international arms sales by far. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a terrible situation. And when you have big encompassing problems across this whole spectrum of, of uh, national uh, life, you know, it can't be due to small reasons. It can't, we can't segment it and say, we, well, we didn't do enough on education in the last five years or something like that. Uh, it's the system. It's the system that's the problem. So we live and work in this system of political economy, this operating system that really under, uh, under uh, lies our, 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 our political economy. And it's delivering terrible results. Uh, and it follows, I think, that if we want to do something to really change the direction and build this America the possible uh, by mid-century, we, we, we've got to engage in system change. We've got to drive uh, systemic, transformative change until we have basically a new system of political economy, a new operating system that routinely delivers good results for human and natural communities. And, uh, and to do that, you've got to understand, I think, first, uh, what are the elements of the current operating system that we have today? These negative forces that have pushed us into this sea of troubles, uh, you know, what are these forces that have to be uh, changed? Uh, and in general, uh, I think the, you know, our problems stem, uh, first of all, uh, from a series of forces that really define this uh, ruthless, rapacious brand of capitalism that we have unleashed. This is not the textbook uh, capitalism um, uh, that, you know, it's that capitalism that we uh, actually have. And I'm reminded of, of uh, the well-known economics, macroeconomics text by Paul Samuelson and Bill, my friend Bill Nordhaus, where they say that ours is a ruthless economy. And, uh, and indeed it is. Uh, and the second set of forces that I think we have to contend with are those that stem from the national security state that we have built, uh, starting with the Cold War and extending in, uh, into the present. So I want to discuss with you the elements uh, of these two features, uh, of America's capitalism and of this national security state. Uh, but to make some general points uh, first and come back to that in a minute, uh, what we, the, the combination of these forces as yields a, a system that has overwhelming priority on profit, on, profit on, on production, GDP growth, and on international power. And it really does not prioritize people and place and planet. And uh, so the point I want to stress now uh, as this first point is that uh, is the centrality uh, of systemic change uh, to move to really a new economic uh, paradigm uh, that is focused on giving priority to people and to place and, and to planet. And I think, you know, another point uh, to make in this, this first point is that it seems very clear to me that if we're going to ever have this type of systemic transformative change, we're going to need a new politics uh, to get there. Uh, and, and I think we have better get started because possibility uh, is being closed down uh, on, a reg on a routine basis uh, today. It's being closed down by this creeping uh, plutocracy and, and corporatocracy uh, that is, you know, the accretion of money power over people power in our politics is being closed down by the militarization uh, that is now 
far advanced. Uh, it, it's being closed down by the emergence of real disruption in the global climate. Uh, and it's being closed down on a regular basis by the by the power of uh, the financial sector, in particular the big banks, which have gotten more concentrated since 2008 and which really control the major investment decisions in, in our economy uh, today. So the first general point is that we live and work in this system of political economy that's failing us, and if we want to really fix the problem to move to an America the possible by mid-century, we need to start thinking about system change uh, as a fundamental uh, objective. And the second uh, point is that, you know, we, and it's something I, that grew on me as I worked on the book, we need a compelling vision uh, of, of what that America of the possible uh, could be. Because when systemic change does come, it'll come because the people that are advocating for change have presented a positive vision of a future that's really worth uh, fighting for. Uh, and, and it's gotta be attractive enough and plausible enough that people are willing to take the real risk of cutting loose uh, from the only present, the only reality uh, that they know, and, and risking uh, something uh, that's very different uh, and, and hopeful. And, and uh, you know, I think describing this America of the 2050 is a is tricky business. And I, I'm, I'm didn't find too many people that had tried, honestly, uh, uh, to do it. And so, what is it? Fools rush in. Uh, and so in chapter five, you'll find uh, my uh, envisioning of what life uh, could be uh, in 2050. In 2050, we will have climbed out of this basement that we find ourselves in now uh, in the OECD. We will have headed off uh, calamities uh, that, that could divert time and attention and money uh, from doing things that need to be doing, calamities like climate change. Um, uh, we will have experienced, and I think this is fundamental, a deep transformation in our culture and values away from the materialism and the anthropocentrism and the contempocentrism uh, of today. And we will have opted for, for lack of a better word, globalization. Uh, excuse me, glocalization, uh, where we, uh, that was a nice slip, uh, you know, where we're really focusing on uh, building up uh, community, uh, rebuilding community, uh, uh, rootedness, and combining that with the best elements of, uh, of, of globalization. Um, I think the third imperative is to appreciate that um, envisioning a better future is, uh, that's plausible and attractive at the same time uh, requires another step, and that is uh, defining and examining uh, how we can move forward confidently to that future. I mean, it's one thing to paint a beautiful picture, but if people don't have a sense of how to get there, of what are the practical steps that we could be taking uh, in our policies uh, in Washington, in our work uh, on the ground in our communities, uh, then you know we'll never, we won't get beyond just dreaming that that future is there. So um, in the book, I, I, I describe how this systemic change can come uh, by pursuing a series of interacting, mutually reinforcing uh, transformations. Uh, the transformations that can undermine the, the structures of the current system that are these forces that are yielding bad results and replace these old structures uh, with uh, new arrangements uh, and new incentives for a sustaining economy and a successful democracy. So in the book I describe in some detail uh, how we can do uh, the following. Uh, in the market, uh, from a near laissez-faire uh, to powerful market governance in the public interest from dishonest prices in the market to honest ones, uh, from commodification uh, to protection of the commons. In the corporation, uh, from shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy, from this predominantly one motivational and ownership model to new business models involving alternative forms of ownership, and to the democratization of capital and the democratization of major investment decisions economic democracy uh, at many levels, in, in money and finance, uh, from Wall Street to Main Street, uh, from money created overwhelmingly from bank debt uh, to money created by government, uh, as uh, Lincoln uh, now revived uh, in the cinema, uh, was doing and proposed. Um, 
in economic growth, from this growth fetish that we have to a post-growth uh, society, from mere GDP growth, which I will argue uh, isn't delivering uh, and will not, uh, to growth in human welfare and growth in democratically determined priorities. Uh, I, I think this growth fetish that we have is a, really a snare and a delusion. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, since 1980, we've had tons of growth. The economy today is 125% bigger, I think, than it was in, in 1980. And during all this period of great expansion of the economy, life satisfaction in the country flatlined. Uh, uh, inequality mounted rapidly. Um, poverty mounted rapidly uh, in the teeth of all this growth. Uh, environment uh, declined. 42,000 manufacturing facilities fled our borders. Uh, wages flatlined. Uh, growth isn't delivering. And, uh, and it's a mistake to think that simply, you know, running up GDP is going to solve our, our problems. Um, it deflects attention from stimulating and doing the things that we really need to do. Uh, and it further empowers the corporations and the banks because we look to them to deliver this growth. And as long as we're prioritizing growth, we have to do what they want, in effect. And almost so a long, long list of progressive objectives in Washington, the principal argument against them is that it would harm the economy, it would slow growth, on and on. Uh, in social conditions, uh, from this vast economic insecurity we have to, uh, and these inequities that we have, to fundamental fairness. Uh, and, um, you know, from joblessness to good jobs, uh, guaranteed. Uh, in indicators from uh, this GDP worship that we have, uh, grossly distorted picture, um, GDP, to really accurate measures of social and environmental uh, well-being. Uh, to new indicators of uh, environmental health and the quality of life. In consumerism, from this um, consumerism that we are so afflicted with in our affluenza uh, to sufficiency and mindful consumption. Uh, from more, always more, to enough. Uh, and from owning uh, to sharing. In our communities, uh, from runaway enterprises and throwaway communities to vital local economies from social rootlessness to rootedness and solidarity, in dominant cultural values, uh, from getting uh, to giving, from richer to better, from separate to connected, from apart from nature to part of nature, from near term to long term. Moynihan said the central conservative truth is that culture and values really matter and determine the fate of societies. The central liberal truth, he said, was that a society can, through its political process, change its culture and change its values. We don't simply have to wait around for values to change. We know something about what, uh, how we can uh, improve uh, our values and our motivations and our habits of thought. Uh, in foreign policy and the military, from this uh, excessive uh, exceptionalism, uh, to America, as Chalmers Johnson put it, as normal nation. From hard power to soft, from militarization to real security, and a new definition of global uh, citizenship. So these are the transformative changes that the book talks about uh, for the most part. Uh, uh, it's really what the book I is all about. Um, and I think there are a lot of people working in these various areas uh, in the U.S. today. There are groups dedicated to deep change in these areas. Um, and I think then the, the fourth imperative uh, is the imperative, if any of this is going to happen, of a new uh, democratic uh, reality uh, in our country. Um, you know, whether we are seeking transformative change, as, as I would advocate, or whether we are seeking uh, mere incremental reform uh, across in, in these areas, uh, you know, the, the two essential steps are implementing a series of pro-democracy political reforms that I hope will gather strength in the wake of this election that we've uh, just been through. And, and secondly, in building a unified, a truly unified and progressive and organized uh, uh, and powerful progressive movement that uh, pulls all of these different progressive communities uh, together with a common platform, a common identity, a common uh, set of, of objectives. And, and so the final chapters of the book describe uh, what I, at least what I think is needed uh, 
uh, in both of these uh, areas. Uh, they set out an agenda of needed political reforms, uh, reforms that secure the vote and secure the voters, uh, uh, reforms that uh, undermine the power of big money uh, in our politics, and reforms that shift uh, power from corporations to people in the policy-making process. Remember, corporations spend 10 times as much maybe on uh, lobbying activity as they do on uh, you know, campaigns. Uh, so I want to stress that uh, you know, the progressive communities in the U.S. today are extraordinarily uh, siloed in their, in their organization. They, they're, you know, the groups don't really work together uh, as, they, as they should. Uh, and if we remain that way, we're not going to be able to take advantage of the positive opportunities that will be opened up for deep change by this uh, deep uh, disenchantment, I think, uh, that people feel, and, uh, and also by the ongoing crises, which we have not seen the last of, I, I don't think. Uh, so we need this unified progressive identity. We need concerted efforts to institutionalize coordination. We need a common infrastructure among progressives for formulating clear policy objectives and strategic messages. And we need a commitment to building a powerful, unified movement from the ground uh, up. The second thing I would say is that, um, you know, achieving meaningful changes is going to require uh, the rebirth of marches and protests and demonstrations and direct action and nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. Uh, you know, protests dramatize issues. They show the depth of concern that people have. They attract media attention. They build sympathetic support if they're done properly. Uh, and they put issues on, on the agenda. So I followed my friend Bill McKibben's lead into the central cell block of the D.C. jail for three days uh, a year or so ago protesting the, uh, the tar sands pipeline. Uh, and I would do it again. Uh, in fact, I might do it again. There's ample opportunities, I think, are going to come up to, uh, to do that. Um, but in the end, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we've got to be willing to sacrifice and put it all on the line and um, get out of our comfort zones. Um, so I think there's a theory of change that, that runs uh, throughout uh, the book. And, um, and it has everything uh, to do with people seeing the system uh, as a problem of seeing the need uh, for system change, uh, of realizing that a positive vision it can, in fact, be realized in our country, that there is an alternative, that a better world uh, is uh, possible. And uh, it involves the progressives uh, coming together. It involves uh, people being willing to, to take risks for their, to promote these uh, causes. Uh, and uh, it involves being prepared for crises, which will come, but we weren't prepared for the economic crisis in 2008 to really uh, have that as an opportunity to move uh, uh, the agenda uh, forward. Uh, so we don't know how these forces will emerge and uh, interact, all of them, uh, but we, you know, we do know that this, it's going to be a struggle, and, uh, and we need to be uh, prepared uh, for uh, that struggle. Now, many of you are here, uh, you know, associated uh, um, with, with this organization because of your interest in international affairs. So let me uh, sound off, if I might, a little bit on, on, on that front and tell you a little bit about what the book uh, says on that issue in my uh, final comments here. Um, you know, the, the, the view that I have come to is that the U.S. posture in the world reflects a radical imbalance. Uh, it's a hugely disproportionate focus on the military and on economic issues, and a tragic neglect of some of the most serious challenges that we and others uh, face. Uh, you probably know the data on the sheer size and magnitude of the U.S. military and security uh, establishment. Um, you know, our military spending is almost half of the world total. It's larger than the next 17 uh, countries uh, combined. If you add all the security spending, uh, which, you know, includes the CIA and as well as the Pentagon and other and homeland security, uh, it's over a trillion dollars uh, annually. Uh, it's a fourth of all federal spending. It's two thirds of all discretionary uh, spending. Um, 
The Pentagon's 2010 base structure report says that, that we maintain 662 military uh, sites in 38 uh, countries around the world. But they don't count several of the big places we are, and the best estimates that we have suggest that we have about a, a, a thousand military sites and bases of different types uh, and different sizes uh, around the world. And so we, we garrison the world in a way that no empire uh, ever has. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're 70 percent of the global arms business. Um, you know, it was estimated uh, that by 2010 we had uh, 13,000 uh, special operations uh, troops deployed in 75 countries in clandestine and, uh, and, and uh, covert operations. That's 40 percent uh, of the world's uh, countries. I won't go into the power now of the military industrial complex, which is a, you know, maybe the most single most powerful political operation uh, in the country. Uh, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail on the Washington Post's dramatic uh, revelations about the, the size of, uh, of this uh, top secret world that we've created uh, since September 11. Um, you know, they report that it's become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much money it costs, how many people it employs, or how many programs exist within it. But they did make some estimates at the Post, and they concluded that some 1,300 government organizations and 1,900 private companies work on programs related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence in some 10,000 locations in the United States. Amazing, huh? It's going on, and nobody's done anything about it. Um, and, um, you know, this uh, national security state has created a, a world of trouble. Whatever good it's done, and I don't deny that it has done some good, uh, uh, it's a you know, huge drain on the federal budget, a major assault on our privacy and civil liberties, and a serious distortion of our national politics through uh, the military-industrial complex. So, uh, William Pfaff and Chalmers Johnson noted also that the global base systems tends to intensify and produce the very insecurity that were, it originally was justified uh, by. Um, and, um, you know, one consequence of the militarism that is creeping uh, in our society steadily is that one does end up uh, in wars. Um, and uh, we may have a lot of unconventional sources of war uh, coming at us. The recent books that I have in my library bear the titles uh, Resource Wars, Water Wars, Climate Wars, three different uh, books. Um, and, um, you know, there is the threat that many people have pointed to of the, you know, imperial presidency, and uh, which our uh, current president has not done anything to uh, address, I don't think. Um, uh, and, you know, then the final sorrow of empire is this draining psychological uh, burden uh, that, you know, th that what we see happening in the world has on, has on us uh, as events unfold. Uh, we either experience uh, sadness and depression or, or denial, or at worst, we harden our, our spirits uh, against, uh, you know, uh, our, our employees and our contractors engaged in, in torture, the large killing of innocent civilians, uh, murders even, and taking of body parts as souvenirs, renditions, drone assassinations, military detention without trial, collaboration with unsavory regimes. I mean, it really gets to you. In the meanwhile, outside of this pentagon of, of plenitude, um, you know, we've badly neglected challenges uh, like international governance, uh, other than in the security and economic areas. Uh, um, you know, we've defaulted on our responsibilities for global climate protection and other environmental needs. We badly underperformed in the development and humanitarian assistance. And I can tell you as head of the UNDP for six years, I experienced that uh, firsthand. We've underinvested invested in major challenges like global population and transnational organized crime, uh, failed and fragile states, water management and food supply, pandemic diseases and clean energy, and we've generally uh, neglected uh, what security analysts have, have termed uh, preventive strategies uh, rather than offensive and defensive uh, ones. Um, so, you know, the book argues and makes the case and tries to propose some answers 
for the fact that uh, our economic and political life uh, has, suffers uh, internationally from this uh, severe uh, imbalance um, in, in our attention. Um, so I think the, uh, in conclusion, um, I think it really all comes down uh, to, uh, to us, to the American people, and, and whether we have it in us still uh, to use our freedom and our democracy in, in powerful ways to create an, an America the possible. Uh, I think we can realize a new American dream uh, if enough of us uh, join together and fight for it. Uh, I think we can envision uh, an America where the pursuit of happiness is sought uh, not always in more getting and spending, but in the growth of human solidarity, uh, in real democracy, in devotion to the public good, uh, where the average American is empowered uh, to really achieve uh, the human potential, uh, where the benefits of economic activity are widely shared, uh, where the environment is sustained for current and future generations, where internationally we have assumed the role of good citizen and normal nation, and where the virtues of uh, simple living, community self-reliance, good fellowship, and respect for nature uh, predominate. These have been, uh, as many authors have addressed, uh, American traditions, uh, but they haven't been the prevailing ones, uh, generally speaking, but they are certainly not dead. Uh, these objectives, these traditions await us, I think, and I would even argue that they are being awakened across this great land uh, today with new ways of living and working and sharing and caring emerging across America. Uh, they beckon us with a new American dream, one that is rebuilt of, out of who we, the best of who we were in the past and the best of who uh, we can be. I thank you very, very much for your attentiveness. Gus, thanks very much for those remarks. I think our audience could not have wished for a more substantive talk. Uh, you outlined the problems. You provided us with uh, policies as solutions and ways of implementing those policies. But our audience, of course, has some questions. So let's start with the questions. Uh, and I should point out that uh, uh, the audience might be a little depressed after your talk, so the, uh, the first question is, is there anything you can think of that the United States is doing right? Yes. Uh, no, I think uh, uh, on uh, gay and lesbian rights, a tremendous progress uh, has, has been made uh, and is being made uh, uh, now, uh, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, I lived, uh, as you might have detected, uh, through the civil rights uh, revolution in the South, and uh, and I've seen real change come to this country. Uh, I think you know we've uh, and we, in a way, uh, rose to the moment in this past election. In my view, uh, we went bypassed uh, a, a lot of cynicism and a lot of uh, money, uh, and. Uh, you know, kept their heads together uh, pol politically. Th th them's my views. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot to be proud of. Uh, and, and, and contrary to the, um, Chuck, to the idea that, um, that we, um, you know, should be depressed, I, I, I hope that we'll be motivated um, that by the very problems. Um, you know, um, the situation is utterly hopeless, and therein lies the hope. Uh, the people are going to say, I'm really fed up with this, and I want to understand why we're suffering like we are in this country, and, and I want to know what we can do about it, and I want to start doing it. And I've got children and grandchildren I'm worried about. That's where we are. You, you provided a compelling list of uh, actions, policies, but how can we mobilize concerns and action given the degree of polarization, the power of vested interests, and the import of Citizens United? Well, we could change the Constitution, and I, there's a real uh, effort underway in the country now to do that, to, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, moved to amend and, um, and other uh, movements uh, underway to, to undo this terrible string of Supreme Court decisions. It didn't stop with Citizens United and continues on with decisions in Arizona and Montana. Um, but, um, you know, I, I th the book does have in it a, a, a chapter on, on how we can uh, uh, 
Uh, and, and I think it, it, how we can move forward with political reforms. A and they are, you know, I mentioned some of them uh, in my talk. We've got to build a broad uh, constituency in the country to uh, to save democracy, really. I mean, it's a really, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a serious problem with uh, securing the vote, securing the voters, uh, uh, you know, we need to have independently determined uh, congressional districts. We need to break this two-party duopoly that we have with uh, things like fusion voting, like New York State has, where you can run a third party without being a spoiler because the third party is allowed to list a major candidate as it's one of its candidates, as its candidate, uh, and, and therefore you don't throw your vote away and the third party can bargain with the other parties to get the best result. And they have it in New York and the Working Families Party does a pretty good job of, of uh, moving events uh, there. Uh, we need to change the Constitution to do in this uh, string of, uh, uh, of decisions that Citizen United is the most famous example of, but we also need to do in this electoral college uh, process that we have. Uh, and we need a lot of reforms in the Congress. And as Democrats now have the power to do away with this darn filibuster procedure, right now they could do it with a simple majority uh, at the beginning. They have to act at the beginning of a Congress. Uh, and, and on and on, there's a lot that we could do, and we need to come together and do it. And it doesn't have to be just the left that does it, because I think a lot of the Tea Party people are really fed up with this, with this money. Uh, they didn't like that either. We ought to be able to build a, a big constituency for, you know, for, for real democracy uh, in our country. And, and indeed, uh, you know, one of the states that has a fair election law, uh, which involves uh, public and small donor financing of elections, uh, is Arizona. And, uh, and when the, uh, you know, the conservative forces in Arizona saw that, they moved out and took advantage of it. And uh, so it's not just a, you know, a liberal progressive issue. This is, this is something that we ought to be able to come together on. Thank you. You, uh, you suggest a coalition of uh, NGOs, of nonprofits, to move the uh, agenda along. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> that's uh, going to take a long time, and maybe it's 2050. How far off is that? It's a few years. Uh, do you think that uh, if the Democratic Party during the recently concluded election had embraced your policies uh, that it would have had success? No. Uh, I mean, I think most of the prescriptions that, um, uh, that, uh, that are in the book uh, deal with longer-term changes that we need to build up uh, support for. We need to invest in transformative change and deep systemic change uh, at the same time that we are also continuing to push forward with the uh, sort of reform agendas, uh, and, uh, and there are some things that we can't wait on. I mean, it will take time to, to really transform the very core uh, of, the, of the sort of political economy of the United States. That's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take sacrifice. In the long run, we won't solve these problems or really move forward uh, to, to a, 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 a better uh, country. But in the meanwhile, there are desperate things like jobs and uh, dealing with the climate issue uh, and uh, some semblance of tax justice uh, that we've got to make the current system deliver on because we just can't wait anymore. Uh, and um, so I, I, I think we've got to walk on two legs, in effect. Uh, and, and while we're dealing with these longer-term issues, uh, you know, for deep, deeper change and building up support for them and helping people see that it really is the system that's the problem, we've also got to, uh, you know, get busy with some type of um, legislative action on a, a series of other issues that uh, they can't wait. So dealing with jobs and taxes, uh, do you feel that the Occupy movement is moving in the right direction? Yes. Talk a little bit about where it might go. I was trying to be brief. Okay, <laughs> you did it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, well, let's talk about jobs a minute. I mean, um, you know, we have a desperate problem in the country, you know, with the unemployment and another equal number of people, roughly, uh, that, that are working uh, below their uh, training and, and expectations and, and are either dropped out of the labor force or working full time. And um, to think that somehow this problem is really going to be addressed by ratcheting up GDP, 
is, is really foolish, I think. It's just not going to happen. We're not going to grow in GDP uh, at a rate that uh, is going to deal effectively uh, with this problem. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was saying that, but I want you to know that somebody who, you know, is a lot better at uh, these things than I am. It just came out. Uh, I don't know if you know Jeremy Grantham, uh, a major, uh, you know, Boston investment advisor and investor. And, uh, you know, he recently uh, came out with another version of his quarterly newsletter pointing out that, um, you know, we are, uh, we will sustain probably real growth rates of about 1% a year in the U.S. for the foreseeable future. I mean, and, you know, it takes 3% just to keep Keep the three percent. If you look at the curve between, you know, unemployment uh, and um, and growth, it takes about three percent growth just to take care of the new entrance into the labor force in the U.S. in in recent times. And you know, to really deal with the unemployment issue, you have to grow even faster. And we're just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. And if you really care about these about people who are unemployed and underemployed and are dropped out of the labor force and a long term unemployment, you've got to have programs that go directly at at their needs. And that means, you know, federal funding of very uh, targeted programs. You know, we have this huge problem in the country. We have these tremendous unmet needs. And it's all these people who want to work. And the only thing that we have to connect them is government. And, and so, you know, it's really a tremendous tragedy that we have these, uh, you know, repeated attacks on government. And now this, I hope, you know, if you're interested in this, I hope you'll, you'll read Paul Kirkman's column today on uh, on this fake, uh, you know, fiscal cliff and uh, a fake austerity thing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think, I mean, not that, well, you'll see what he says. Uh, I think it was quite, uh, uh, quite well put uh, today on the way that this, uh, the fiscal cliff is being um, manipulated into uh, the case for austerity in our country. Uh, and that's what he, you know, is, is complaining about. And, uh, and, and, and who's behind it? He named names. Uh, at least one uh, <laughs> today. Anyhow, yes. But are you talking about a significantly increased uh, budget for the federal government then? Well, I want to wait, make one point because I know a lot of you are interested in international affairs. Um, uh, you know, I... I I think if you look at the overall spending on international affairs, whether it's um, military or security or otherwise, uh, we have to be very, if we, the real thing we ought to do with that money is reallocate it uh, into meeting some of these underfunded international needs. So the people who want to sort of solve the deficit problem uh, by taking money out of our international spending, I think it should be severely reallocated, but I'm not at all sure it should be, you know, reduced and used for, uh, for budget reduction. Um, you know, we are right now, uh, I didn't mention this superlative, we are the least taxed country uh, in that group of 20 advanced democracies also. The least. Um, there's, you know, countries rich, there's plenty of money, it's just uh, not being managed well. And uh, so, you know, do I, uh, would I favor the, the uh, federal government um, uh, growing in size? Uh, yes, if we really had uh, a, a real democracy that was, you know, powerfully, uh, powerfully affecting the priorities rather than this, uh, you know, we, corporations, we've always known they're the principal economic actors, but they're the principal political actors in this system now. And if we don't reassert real democracy, I mean, who's going to trust government to, 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 with, with these big responsibilities? So it all goes together in my judgment. You say that there are the big political factors, actors, and yet the recent election may not have proven that. Oh, I'm not sure uh, about that at all. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think what the recent election showed is that the kind of spending that, that was being carried out by some very wealthy individuals didn't have the intended effect, and the effort to suppress votes uh, actually uh, led to uh, to, to a reaction that uh, people insisted on having their vote counted, darn it, and uh, and that was all all to the good. But I I don't think that um, I think there was uh, you know um, I think both sides got got a lot of money from Wall Street in this campaign, uh, and I I think the fundamentals uh, of our political process uh, uh, have it changed. Um, 
you know, they may be uh, uh, come together more now because they don't have this uh, this goal of defeating Obama <laughs> uh, left. But uh, and and as I said earlier, remember that um, you know that the corporations spend a lot more on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on the, the influencing uh, the political process after elections than they do during it, and uh, and that great slosh of money is 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 still still there, and the, and and, the, and it's not just money that that is powerful about corporations. I mean, they they have tremendous other uh, means of power, um, in, including as I say, you know, when you. Uh, you know, Tom Friedman, in, in one of his books, used the, the phrase about globalization. He said it was a golden uh, straitjacket. I mean, uh, basically, it, uh, you know, you got some benefits, but it, it put you in a political straitjacket. Uh, well, that's basically what this growth imperative uh, does. It, it basically, uh, you know, empowers those who we look to to deliver growth. And, uh, and, 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 and I think, um, you know, that uh, in our society— uh, uh, you know, our government doesn't own much of the economy, and uh, so we really depend on the corporations to deliver it. And uh, and so you're in this uh, golden straitjacket where maybe you get some growth, uh, maybe you don't. But uh, in the meanwhile, you're severely limited in what you can do. In the book, I have a long list of sort of policy measures that I think would uh, uh, improve social well-being, uh, the quality of life in our country. Uh, across a you know, whole spectrum of, of concerns. But if you put them all together, they would undoubtedly slow, the, slow economic growth. I mean, they would act as a, a, a damper on growth. But if quality of life is improving and you have real, real measures of, um, uh, of, uh, econ of economic, uh, sustainable economic welfare, which we don't now have, uh, you know, it would, uh, you wouldn't care if it slowed GDP growth. Uh, because GDP is just a measure of Every darn thing that money is spent on in the economy it includes tremendous uh, misspending and bad things as well as good things. And the idea that somehow, uh, you know, it's going to solve all our problems by having more of it is, uh, you know, is, a, is, is I, I like Herman Daly's uh, phrase that we're in a period of uneconomic growth <laughs> where the costs of trying to achieve extra increments of growth are probably exceeded by all the uh, social, environmental, and psychological and community and other costs that uh, it brings to us. While you were at the UN, you were responsible for overseeing the uh, UN Development Index. And I uh, wonder whether uh, you see that as a, an adequate index of uh, people's happiness or uh, Well, there is a, the, 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 you're referring to the Human Development Index. Human Development and Index. I, I, think that, I think it is a, a very, uh, strong measure, and and it has now been uh, done um, uh, by a group that I cite uh, some uh, several times in in the book uh, for the U.S. states. There is now a U.S. Human Development Report that looks at each state uh, from a human development perspective. So it, it looks not not really at at GDP, but it it it, it looks at uh, purchasing power. Uh, educational attainment, uh, health attainment, and other things, and tries to combine those in a way that, that doesn't overweigh, uh, uh, you know, the, the purchasing power. And it's, I think, a powerful index, and, uh, and, and it's now been done for the, for the U.S. In, in two national reports, not by UNDP, but by an independent group. Returning to your comments on taxes, uh, I assume that you would uh, support Warren Buffett's a recent column in which he uh, suggests that the super rich are not paying their fair share of, ta of taxes. Yes, it was a good. It was a good. It was in the Times also today, uh, right with Paul Krugman's uh, piece. Um, in your book, you talk about uh, fiscal policy, about banks, and about currencies. Do you have an opinion on the role of local currencies in the creation of? robust local economies? Well, I'd like to see them used more. I'm familiar pr principally with the uh, Berkshires, uh, the local, econ local currency in the, in, the, in the Berkshires. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, there, there is a role for, uh, for these, uh, you know, non-official, uh, ex you know, uh, exchanges. Um, 
there are other ways uh, that people are proposing of, uh, you know, using the uh, the internet and other means just to, to clear, uh, you know, to pay debts and, and clear exchanges. Um, I'm, I'm even more interested, though, in something that uh, is implicit there, I think, and, and that is uh, in the public banking movement uh, and in in recreating the kind of local banking and responsible, boring, uh, community-focused banking that we had after after World War II that really made the you know, let the uh, country, and 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 in the book, I also uh, deal with um, this uh, proposal. I uh, deal with it positively. Uh, to um, basically, as I said in my talk, all the money out there is uh, is bank debt. If everybody paid off their debts, there wouldn't be much money left. Uh, so it's all uh, you know, pulling down uh, uh, and. Um, and I think that we ought to put the government back in the business of uh, of, of making money, making the money uh, for our society. And you know, you could do that by uh, having 100% reserve requirements on uh, demand deposits uh, uh, in banks, 100%. And uh, they can loan out the uh, the timed uh, deposits, CD type uh, deposits uh, over the time, and uh, but the, most of the what the spending uh, of money into the economy would be uh, would be done by government, just as Lincoln wanted it. There are a couple of uh, questions related to carbon tax. I wonder if you could uh, talk about it. Uh, in, here's a one of the questions: mm -hmm. uh, Carbon tax is being discussed at the federal level. Conservatives from CEO of Exxon to Greg Markin and Art Laffer have shown support. What's your, inner, what's your opinion of this policy vehicle as a way to begin to address climate change at the federal level? And uh, another uh, questioner adds that uh, uh, it's been estimated that there's a 20 to 25 percent likelihood of a carbon tax being passed, and it might bring in up to a trillion dollars revenue uh, how would you feel about a carbon tax? I have stopped being particular about uh, the, the approach that I think the government ought to take to the climate issue. I would love to have a carbon tax. Uh, I would love to have a cap and dividend uh, program, uh, and either one of them could raise revenues that the government needs. And uh, the dividend, cap and dividend has an extra advantage as it takes most of the money and gives it back to families. Uh, and, and, you know, gets paid back out. So it takes it from the carbon emitters and, and gives it to people. And that's attractive uh, in a lot of ways. In, in part, it deals with, it, it, it's one way of at least partially addressing the equity issue of, uh, of running up uh, energy prices. Uh, people get a check twice a year or whatever. And uh, Congressman McDermott, um, is he from Washington State? Has a, has a bill that does this, it's very attractive. Uh, we had this cap and dividend, it's called proposal that uh, 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 Senators uh, Cantwell and, and Collins introduced into the last Congress. I, uh, so I think this is, uh, we've got to do something. Uh, I give Obama credit for the uh, auto standards, the, the increasing mileage standards, and uh, for their current ongoing efforts to do something about power plant emissions. Uh, it, you know, those are good things, uh, but they're not nearly enough. We ought to be on a trajectory of um, of essentially reducing uh, uh, our uh, you know fossil fuel use to a small fraction, five percent uh, of what it is today, and by 2050, that's what we ought to be trying to do, and that's what all the studies say that we uh, need to do. But here's what you're up against: uh, the, the um, about Two-thirds, if, if we do the right thing on climate, about two-thirds of the proven fossil fuel reserves in the world cannot be touched. And this, this is money on the books uh, of these companies uh, right now. And uh, so this is going to take a huge battle. And, and I, uh, I mentioned the fact that, you know, uh, I was. I give Bill McKibben tremendous credit uh, for leading uh, this effort in the country and uh, his ongoing Connected Dots tour that's going on right now, going to twenty-something cities and pointing out, uh, you know, the the reality. The the, the encouraging thing to me uh, about the sad thing that's happening in the world 
uh, which is the reality of ongoing climate disruption and change, is that you know it's bringing the reality of the problem home to home to people, as Sandy did, as the drought has done, and uh, the fires, and you know, but and and that's different from the the the, the support that we uh, had, uh, you know, what created the support for climate action, for example, in 2007, 2008, which was, you know, driven in part by, you know. Uh, uh, scientists and Al Gore and, and others calling attention to the issue, but now we have this issue sma smashing us uh, in the face on a regular basis, and and they, these these people in Washington have got to respond finally, finally. Um, so I uh, I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of hope there that something positive is going to come out of this, uh, and I don't care whether it's a, a carbon tax or a cap and dividend or or uh, something else, but uh, I think it'll, you know, but something something needs to happen. When I was in the Carter administration, my last comment, I think, uh, when I was in the Carter administration in, in 1979, 1980, we issued several reports calling for reducing greenhouse gas emissions dramatically and putting a cap on the buildup of these gases in the atmosphere. Well, that was over 30 years ago. We knew enough to put a, you know, say what it ought to be even. We missed it. We were a little high, uh, but, uh, you know, it, we would be lucky to achieve the goal that we set out in these CEQ reports now. So it's, it's been a great default and a great tragedy. Gus, in light of the current financial crisis, if you uh, knew what you know now and you were just graduating from uh uh, college or university as a recent graduate of uh, Vermont Law School, by the way, um, how, what would you do to start changing the system? Well, I think there are two big things that, that we could, uh, can, can do. Uh, one is that, um, you know, even if my uh, heart was sort of in the environmental area, I, I think if I were going, wanted to do something nationally now, it would be to, to try to uh, work with those organizations that are trying to promote the uh, democratic uh, reforms in our country. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of a sine qua non uh, of our current uh, situation. And so uh, I think that's a major, major place for investment. The other is, is that we don't have to wait on Washington to do things in our, in our local communities. And that's happening across the country. There, all kinds of uh, new business forms being created, public-private hybrids, uh, profit-not-for-profit hybrids, social enterprises, co-ops uh, of all types, uh, you know, uh, uh, new systems of banking, uh, community development corporations, uh, community investment corporations, all kinds of things. Uh, transition towns, uh, community revitalization efforts. It's, a, it's an exciting uh, bottom-up, ground-up uh, movement going on in, in the country, and I, uh, I, I think that's... Uh, you know, that's the single most hopeful thing happening in America today, in my view. Do you think the widespread interest in, in climate issues that came out of Hurricane Sandy will have any real lasting impact on political viewpoint regarding uh, climate issues? Yes. I mean, I, I think it, um, uh, it, it will. Uh, be, and it's part of this, what I was saying a moment ago, it's part of this uh, pattern of, of real world impacts uh, coming forward now. And uh, I mean, we've had a lot of places in the U.S. Uh, uh, set, uh, you know, heat records and uh, temperature records and other things. Uh, and this drought is just unbelievable. But if you go back and look at what the climate models were projecting for what areas of the United States would become hotter and drier, um, they were pretty darn close uh, to, uh, uh, to what is actually happening, uh, including the under-noticed uh, drought in Georgia, which the sort of uh, 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 local leadership has decided that it would not say anything about much because it w they were scared that it would hurt business. This is a true story. Uh, Georgia is, is suffering, and uh, as is much of the rest of the country. I was just in uh, New Mexico. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really been hard. Uh, on those folks, and I, th I think that in the hurricane and other things. I mean, you know, people say, oh, well, this particular event can't be caused by climate change. Well, it can be powerfully affected 
by climate change and powerfully influenced. And the strength of that storm and the and the where it hit and how it moved uh, were all influenced by uh, by the by this climate change that we have already. And it and this is just one basically one degree of Fahrenheit global average warming now. Uh, and uh, all of this we're seeing is, uh, uh, and you know the uh, so, you know the the betting money right now is betting on four degrees Celsius, big degrees global average warming in this century. That's going to be bonkers, uh, you know. And and finally, the World Bank spoke out about it uh, the other day in a major report, uh, saying that. Uh, you know, but I, but uh, you know, here we here we are. Uh, we're in California. God bless you, uh, California. You're doing something about it, uh, and uh, you know, and and I and some of the climate, uh, you know, heroes of uh, of, of Sandy, um, uh, you know, had um, avoided the issue. I mean, Chris Christie pulled New Jersey out of the uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative uh, that the northeastern states had entered into. It was one of his first acts. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the president um, uh, did not mention the issue uh, for two years almost uh, and, and intentionally did not mention it in the campaign. Lisa Jackson said that, uh, that they would you know, been uh, it's a policy not to deal with the issue in the campaign. Uh, so that was, it's all pretty scary, uh, but I think it's changing slowly. Uh, things are coming back, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Gus, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, the last question, and I just want to say on behalf of everyone here that we very much appreciated your uh, incredibly uh, ambitious and uh, most interesting talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. much.